CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the invisible disease that is probably going to haunt legends of our sport when they are all but gone from the spotlight, strangling their hold on cognizance by method of damage in their brains from the massive amounts of head trauma they may have experienced in their careers. MMA is an unforgiving business and leaves its participants marked both on the surface and on the inside. Antonio Bigfoot Silva is one such legend of the sport, a man who has provided us entertainment, sacrificing long-term health, donating his fair share of blood, ligament damage, broken bones, and worst of all, concussive and subconcussive brain trauma. A quick history on CTE. It is a relatively new pathology, having first been observed under a different name in 1928, being named Punch Drunk Syndrome, by Dr. Harrison Martland when he published a paper in the Journal of the American Medical Association, where he characterized the condition as an onset of speech problems, brain fog, confusion, and tremors. The term was later renamed Dementia Pugilistica, in an attempt to make the term less disrespectful to the pugilists of the time. Evidence was uncovered that CTE only affected individuals who had suffered an appreciable volume and quality of blows to the head, and not much else work was done on the subject until the 2000s, when Dr. Bennett Omalu, who had the movie Concussion based on him, examined brain tissue of Mike Webster, an American football player who had exhibited symptoms of dementia pugilistica, or CTE, in the years that led to his untimely death at the age of 50. Omalu examined brain tissue samples from Webster and had found that they exhibited the same pathology as the brains of individuals who suffered from Alzheimer's and dementia. How many times do you need to be hit in the head? Nobody knows. If you remember Jordan Parsons, a young Bellator MMA fighter that died in 2016 at the age of 25 after being run over by a car, he was diagnosed with CTE after a post-mortem autopsy. He had wrestled in high school, and started MMA at 17 years of age, garnering only 13 professional fights. How many times had he been suplexed or taken down without breaking his fall in wrestling? How many times had he been wobbled in and out of competition practice? One would wager far less than fighters like Bigfoot Silva, who had been around the sport since the early 2000s. This is going to get kind of deep into the mechanism of CTE, so if you want to learn something new, stick around. If not, I have included timestamps down below so you can skip this section entirely. Think about all the moments in a fight where you can sustain brain trauma without even necessarily being punched or kicked in the head. Think about the rapid acceleration and deceleration of your head when your blast doubled onto the mat or get thrown with an uchimata or a seonage. Or, after a fighter is knocked out and they go careening towards the mat, their heads accelerating at a rate of 9.8 meters per second squared, bouncing the back of their heads which houses the cerebellum, which contains roughly 50% of all the neurons in your body, and the brainstem, which is responsible for autonomic functions off of the cold, unforgiving canvas. Because the gray and white matter of your brain have different densities, they move at different velocities, causing a shearing or pulling apart like tearing of the axons that connect at the junction between gray and white matters of your brain, leading to axonal damage like Wallerian-like degeneration of axons. Wallerian-like degenerations can be categorized as the lesions along the axon of a neuron, where signal transmission between axons is disrupted. The damage can spread through the rest of the axon and transmit itself onto previously uninjured neurons through anterograde degeneration cell body of the damaged neuron can by means of retrograde degeneration or dying back phenomenon die. Axonal varicosities are swellings along the axon that can lead to the blocking of nerve impulse transmissions due to possible disruptions of the nodes of Ranvier, which are unmyelinated segments of the axon critical in saltatory conduction necessary to action potential generation. After repeated exposures to mild brain trauma, the autopsies of affected individuals have shown some truly awful deformities. Permeabilities of axon membranes have shown to experience changes leading to increases in calcium 2 plus ion concentrations. The high levels of calcium can block sodium movement through the voltage gated sodium channels which greatly detriments the ability for the membrane, for the membrane to depolarize and trigger an action potential which hinders cardiac and muscle cell functions. 
tau proteins, which play roles in stabilization of microtubules and brain cells, detached from microtubules through phosphorylation of certain sites commonly seen in Alzheimer's disease brains. The detached tau then gets hyperphosphorylated or oversaturated with phosphoryl groups, which can lead to the aggregation of tau proteins into neurofibrillary tangles, as well as the structural breakdown of affected microtubules. These tangles disrupt cellular communication and can result in neuronal death. The presence of beta amyloid plaques are present in some, but not all, affected individuals. In a healthy brain cell, amyloid protein precursors are cleaved off of the neuron by enzymes and subsequently eliminated, but in CTE adult brains, as well as some Alzheimer's disease brains, the beta amyloid fragments cluster together to form a sticky, insoluble plaque. These plaque buildups can then gum up at the synapses between the axon terminals and dendrites of neighboring neurons blocking the transmission of neurotransmitter molecules. CTE leads to the reduction of brain mass, and an example of that is the thinning and fenestration of the corpus callosum, the part of the brain that separates and transmits signals between the left and right sides of the brain. Remember the question we posed about how much is too much damage? Well, in an experiment conducted by Dr. Victoria Johnson, autopsies of individuals who had only suffered one concussion yielded the presence of neurofibrillary tangles and beta amyloid depositions, even though the subjects themselves did not exhibit symptoms of CTE. This all brings us back to Bigfoot Silva, who just got signed to fight in Brave CF against Haim Ghazali, following an 11-fight losing streak, 10 of which were lost by KO or TKO, not to mention all the damage he took in other fights, having had 34 MMA fights, losing 12 by a KO, TKO, and being in absurd wars like the Mark Hunt fight, not to mention all of the damage he probably took in sparring sessions through nearly 20 years of involvement in MMA, kickboxing, boxing, and bare-knuckle boxing. Remember, tau hyperphosphorylation and beta amyloid plaques were present after just one concussion. Shame on the commissions, promotions, management, family, and friends that allow Silva to keep fighting. The man is slowly committing assisted suicide in front of our eyes. In about 10 years, I think that he will unfortunately end up, like many fighters before him, fighting a losing battle against his own brain, living every day with tremors, memory loss, confusion, irritability, and a grab bag of other debilitating conditions. The cost of this sport is high, and there will come a day when the bill comes due for fighters like Antonio Bigfoot Silva Max or, or Max Holloway, who absorbed over 1,100 significant strikes. These commissions need to do better. These regulating bodies outside of the United States need to do better. These promotions need to do better. We can't allow our legends of the sport to go out like this, slowly committing suicide. The families need to intervene. Somebody needs to be the adult in this room.